Hello everyone and welcome back. So in the previous lecture, we talked about the alloy designations with regard to aluminium alloys. So in this lecture today, we are going to continue our discussion on aluminium alloys. When you talk about the aluminium alloys, there are basically two categories. One is the wrought alloy and the other one are the cast alloys, right? So this part we have already discussed in the last class as to what are the different aluminium association designations, which we call as AIA designation. Right, so we have seen starting from, you know, this 1000 series, which basically belongs to pure aluminium. We have seen the alloys which starts from 2000 and going all the way to 8000 okay so these alloys are written like this for example uh, if you take any alloy from this 8000 series let's say uh, you can write like uh, aa 8090 aluminium something like that okay so this tells you that we are talking about an aluminium lithium alloy having a particular amount of uh, lithium. So in this case, it's typically about, you know, 2 to 2.5, something like that. And it has uh, some amount of uh, copper. and some amount of uh, magnesium, okay? Right, so it will have other uh, varieties also when this, uh, these digits will vary. The three digits, the last three digits will vary and this will remain the same because this is what indicates the series, right? It tells you that uh, it is aluminum lithium, right? So that is how it is done in terms of, you know, giving the designations and it is true for all other alloys also from 2 to 7 that we discussed. Okay. So now let us talk about the cast alloys. So in the rod alloys, you have seen that uh, there are four digits like one particular digit followed by three more, right? For the 2000 series, similarly for the 3000 series and so on. But when you talk about the cast alloys, these four digits will come down to three digits, like this, okay? 100, So let us see the main uh, alloying elements in each of these categories. So like the previous case, uh, 100 belongs to pure aluminium with minimum of 99% aluminium, okay? And the rest follows a similar kind of designation. For example, in 2000 series, it was copper. So here also 200 means it's aluminium copper. So copper is the main alloying element in this case. The 3000 series or rather the 300 in case of cast alloys belongs to 
aluminium, silicon, and magnesium. So here there are two alloying elements, magnesium and silicon. And sometime you also may have some amount of copper in this alloys. Okay. Four hundred series belongs to aluminium silicon. Five hundred is aluminium magnesium. 700 is aluminium zinc and 800 is aluminium tin alloys okay so this is how the designations are for the cast alloys and depending on these numbers you can also identify the alloying elements, the major alloying elements which are present in a particular alloy. Okay. But there is one more thing that you need to consider in the cast alloys. That is, you know, sometime you might have a decimal point after the last digit. So if you find something like this, or let's say any of the alloys, You might find a decimal and one more digit after that. Okay. So this is also, you know, having a significance. It is not really arbitrary. So this dot that you have that is followed by a particular digit, which will either be zero or one. Okay. For example, you may have 356, 356.0 or 356.1 and things like that. Okay. So what is the meaning of this? What does 0 mean and what does 0 0.1 mean? Let us see that. Okay. So if you see a dot 0 kind of uh, number after the third digit, then this tells you that uh, this is in the form of a casting. This is cast in the shape which is wanted in the final product or close to the final shape which is needed. Okay. So this is net shape or near net shape castings which are made you know by a particular alloy. On the other hand, if you see this, if you see one after the decimal point then this would indicate that it is an ingot which has to be further processed you know to to give it a particular shape that you want for a particular product okay so that is the significance of these two digits that means this 0 0.0 and 0 0.1 that you have in case of the cast alloys now here also uh, some of the alloys are heat treatable and some of them are not like how we have for the rod alloys. So in case of cast alloys, the heat treatable alloys are the 300 series alloys where you have both uh, silicon and magnesium. So due to the presence of these two alloying elements, you know, it can form this precipitate Mg2Si if you do the heat treatment right and the other one which is heat treatable in case of cast alloy is the 700 series okay so here also you have zinc which can form a precipitate with aluminium and here you might also have some amount of magnesium and copper Okay, so these two alloys are the heat treatable cast alloys.
all right okay now if you look at all the alloys here all the cast alloys and if you see their applications this aluminium silicon alloys or rather this aluminium silicon magnesium alloys that is the 300 series alloys are the most widely used aluminium cast alloys any guess why we have chosen this aluminium silicon alloy or the presence of the silicon to be the most common or the most you know useful one any guess as to why this particular alloy and not any other alloy it has lot to do with the silicon and that is why i was emphasizing on this particular alloying element silicon improves the fluidity which is good for filling up the mold so therefore when the molten metal of this aluminium silicon alloys is poured into the mold it can easily take up the shape of the mold and silicon also reduces shrinkage because on solidification silicon expands right so due to these reasons silicon provides a good castability to the alloy this is very similar to another material system that we have in the ferrous materials and that is the cast irons which also exhibit excellent castability and here also silicon has an important role to play so cast irons are the iron carbon alloys where the carbon content is more than 2% till 2% it is still and the moment you go beyond 2% carbon it becomes cast iron so typically in a cast iron you may have 3 to 4% of carbon and in addition to that you may have about typically 2 to 3% of silicon and this has a lot to do with the castability that the cast irons are known for okay so silicon here promotes graphitization that you have in cast iron because here the carbon content is more than 2% and therefore carbon can precipitate in the free form as graphite okay and silicon is an alloying element which promotes graphitization okay so when graphitization happens it leads to volume expansion and therefore it can counter the shrinkage and therefore it will improve the castability and apart from that it also gives rise to good fluidity like how we have in case of the aluminium silicon alloys and therefore you know the cast irons will show very good castability if you look at now if you come back to the aluminium alloys here also silicon plays a similar role in providing good castability to the aluminium alloys so you can say this is the cast iron equivalent in case of aluminium alloys because this kind of alloys possess excellent castability okay and this is why you can cast 
this alloys into any final form or shape that you want for a particular product right and these alloys find numerous applications especially in automotive for example if you open the bonnet of a car you would immediately find this uh, white color block this is nothing but the engine block the engine of the car let me blow it up a little bit so that we can see it clearly yeah so this is what you see as soon as you open the bonnet of the car you see this uh, white color engine block and you know this is in fact uh, made of an aluminium alloy as you could understand from the color then you would have also noticed uh, the wheels this white color wheels that you see in this car for example nowadays uh, the conventional steel wheels are being replaced by such wheels made of an alloy okay and the car manufacturers nowadays are promoting their cars saying that the car comes with alloy wheels okay which look like this and this alloy is nothing but an aluminium alloy okay so this has some advantages in terms of weight reduction so the engine block which used to be made of cast iron which is much heavier is replaced by an aluminium alloy okay so now the wheels which take up lot of weight in the car if those are also replaced by aluminium you can understand how much weight saving that is going to provide and that in turn will provide a much better fuel efficiency because the car will consume a lot less amount of fuel because of a significant reduction in the weight of the car okay so use of these alloys this aluminium alloys will provide a better fuel efficiency and that is why nowadays a lot of car manufacturers are going for aluminium parts especially for the engine and the wheels and in fact in high end cars many other parts are also being replaced by aluminium okay so aluminium is at the core of light weighting in passenger cars in modern times and many of these aluminium parts are made of this aluminium silicon alloys like this engine block and the wheels for example simply because as i said these alloys have got very good castability and therefore they can be cast into the final shape like for example it can be cast in a mold which has the impression of the engine block or has the impression of a wheel okay so therefore this aluminium silicon alloys have found a wide range of applications for automotive okay so now that you know we are talking about an alloy like this which is really very important we need to look at uh, some more details about this alloy as to you know what kind of microstructure you have you know what uh, properties and you know what is the composition and so on so let us talk little bit more about this alloy so if you talk about the binary aluminium silicon alloys aluminium silicon alloys basically is a simple binary eupeptic system and this is the phase diagram of aluminium and silicon so here is the eupeptic point which is 12.6% 
silicon and the temperature you can see here is 577 degrees celsius okay so aluminium silicon alloys form a eutectic at 12.6 percent silicon and 577 degree celsius okay but uh, solubility of uh, silicon in aluminium is not that great it can go maximum to 1.65 percent as you can see from here right so the left of this as you might know the left of the eutectic composition is known as hypo eutectic and the right will be known as the hyper eutectic right so in case of aluminium silicon alloys you can have both you can either have a hypo eutectic aluminium silicon alloy and you can also have hyper eutectic aluminium silicon alloys where the silicon content will be more than 12.6 percent okay all right so let us see you know what is the microstructure of uh, this kind of alloy so we'll first talk about uh, the hyper eutectic and then we'll also look at uh, you know the microstructure of uh, hyper eutectic alloys so if you want to understand uh, what could be the components of the microstructure or the microstructural uh, constituents then you can simply look at this diagram and see as you pull down from the liquid phase so what is going to form okay so if you have studied the eutectic diagrams, the generic eutectic diagrams, you would know that it is basically a transformation from uh, the liquid to two solid phase, right? So as you cool the liquid uh, from the molten state, when it reaches this uh, temperature, it is going to transform into this eutectic, right? So here the eutectic will consist of alpha aluminium, which is a solid solution of uh, silicon into aluminium and the silicon okay so that's the eutectic uh, which is going to form in this case right so if i write it the eutectic reaction will be this what you can see over here also as you pull it down below the eutectic point this is the eutectic which is obtained okay so this is what you are going to see in the microstructure when you look at these alloys but of course how much of this uh, eutectic phase will be present in the microstructure that would depend on the composition as you know so right now we are talking about the hypo eutectic composition that means we are somewhere here on the left of this point okay so that means you can also expect to have some amount of uh, pro eutectic uh, alpha aluminium right so this is what you see over here these uh, white areas that you see that's the aluminium the alpha aluminium and this uh, gray phase that you see all around you know that is the eutectic silicon okay I think I would have noted somewhere. Yeah, you can see it. I don't know whether you can read it over here. Okay. And this white face that you have, that is actually the alpha aluminum. Okay. Now, one thing you can notice over here is the morphology of the silicon morphology of the eutectic silicon
So you can see it over here clearly. What kind of morphology do you see? For example, if I take this particular silicon here, what kind of morphology can you call this? This looks like a needle, isn't it? But uh, this optical micrograph is just a 2D projection. So basically this is a flake. The actual morphology if you see, it's a flake kind of morphology which is obtained in aluminium silicon alloys. Okay? And uh, this kind of uh, morphology is not good for some of the properties, particularly the tensile properties because uh, this might lead to uh, stress concentration, particularly at the ends where it is becoming sharper and that might adversely affect the ductility, right? So that is why many times what is done is uh, this uh, flake morphology is modified to a more uniform and fibrous kind of morphology what you see over here. Do you see this? For example, this entire area over here do you see a significant difference between this morphology that you have and this kind of flake morphology? You can clearly see that, right? So these two are two different sets of uh, alloys. The first ones, that means A and B and C and D that you have. These are two sets of alloys. One is unmodified or as thus. And the C and D that you see over here, these are modified by some additions which can be made to change the morphology of the silicon. Okay. So elements like barium, sodium, strontium, all such elements can be added in very small amount, in minor amounts such as you know 0.05% or 0 0.02% in that kind of quantities to modify this uh, silicon morphology. Okay, so once it is modified, you can see the microstructure of the modified alloy is significantly different in terms of the morphology of the silicon. Okay. In the unmodified case, you have this flake or needle kind of morphology. But in case of the modified one, as you could see, these are fibrous kind of morphology. Okay. And this is uh, beneficial in terms of improving some of the properties, you know, such as the uh, ductility or some other tensile properties. And that is why many times these alloys are modified with the addition of a small amount of modifier, such as barium, sodium, or strontium. Okay. So that is all I have for this lecture. But I am going to see you soon again with more on this topic. Thank you for your attention.